Hello once again. My name's Charles R. Sabo, and I'm back to do part two of the Battle of Gog of Magog, uh, chapter 39 this time. Um, as I've already uh, described in chapter, the Ezekiel 38 video, chapter 39 is a micro view of the Ezekiel 38 encounter. And so as long as you understand that, then you go into this 39th chapter and learn additional information that's going, that will be happening during this encounter in, in the mountains of Israel. So I'm going to start out, I'm going to skip the introduction because you're going to review anyway with me. So the introduction is just to entice people to read, right? Um, first one of chapter 39 of Ezekiel. Therefore, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. The first verse of chapter 39 repeats what the Lord had declared back in 38.2. The conjunction, therefore, seems appropriate since the Lord had just spent thir chapter 38 declaring the judgment that will fall on Gog of the land of Magog, and his bands following military right he continued here to declare more against him now ezekiel 38 2 ezekiel was being commanded to focus set your face against an adversary of god this time ezekiel was to prophecy again of judgment against gog of the land of his potential ancestor magog now according to the Gen genesis 10 according to genesis 10 2 Magog was the second eldest son of Japheth, the youngest son of Noah. Since the Lord had disclosed this prophecy against Gog, he had provided Ezekiel's readers with the bloodline that settled the land after the flood of Noah, which was Magog. Okay, please refer to chapter 38, verse 2, and what I've disclosed there. So here, here you have Magog, all in through here. You have Gomer, who will end up coming over into Eastern Europe. Also, Gomer was in Turkey, uh, what is now Turkey, right? So, Meshach and Tubal are right here. So, let's take a look. The military leader of the land of Magog will also be the chief prince or military sovereign power over the people of Meshach and Tubal. If we analyze the above map, then coordinate with the, the 2022 map on page 49, we'll find that these people to be the country called Georgia, as well as the country of Azerbaijan. This is totally likely since they are heavily influenced by Russia while being on the border. According to Genesis 10, 2, Meshach and Tubal were the fifth and sixth sons of Japheth, son of Noah. Okay, so this is a map of Japheth, Japheth right now after the, basically it's a post Tower of Babylon, uh, Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel. Um, and when they dispersed and spread throughout the world. Okay. Tower of Babylon, sorry. And I will turn you back, this is verse 2, and leave but the sixth part of you, and will cause you to come up from the north parts, and will bring you upon the mountains of Israel. So from what the Lord has declared here, he will turn Gog back from a location not yet in the mountains of Israel. Right? Since we know that 38, 19 through 22 is the judgment against Gog and will have been poured out upon him, then this prophecy here is a micro view of the chapter 38 prophecy. This is much like the comparison between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 uh, of the creation account. The Lord has pro had provided additional deta details that fit within the chapter 38 judgment, just like chapter 2 of Genesis is a micro view of the creation of Genesis chapter 1, more detailed, uh, more details. Um, this gives us more details of the Ezekiel 38 attack. Now, because 38.4 spoke of the turning back of Gog of Russia, we should refer back to what was implied within that verse. Now, if you refer, re review 38 verse 4, I had to take you back and disclose to you what was going on there. I'm just going to read it again. Um, Daniel 11.44 says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore we, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. So 
Daniel 11, 40 through 44. It has to do with the Gog of Magog attacking Egypt, going through the mountains of Israel, and then, and then being drawn back for a reason. All right, drawn back to the mountains of Israel for a reason. Now, Gog, the king of the north, will be heavily involved in punishing the militaries that will want so badly to go into Israel so they can destroy them. Now, the king of the north, Gog, will be defending the seven-year peace covenant of Daniel 9.27 in behalf of Antichrist. Um, Daniel 11, 36 through 39 is the Antichrist. And so when, we, when, when he will be turned back and the Lord will put hooks into his jaws and will bring him forth. Now, I, I, the king of the north will be defending the seven-year peace covenant, right? And the Lord will pull him back from defending that peace covenant, right? Um, we must look at this hook in the jaws of God, King of the North, as a call back to a military alliance, which he had been establishing with Persia, Iran, over the time that he has or had been in office. This military alliance will be demanding that God honor his alliance commitments and go forth against Israel in behalf of Persia. The hook will be so convincingly strong when he will be forced to go forth against the newly established seven-year peace covenant by Antichrist and Israel. Daniel 9, 27. Here we have the king of the north destroying Egypt and the forces defending Egypt. That's Daniel eleven forty-one 41 through 42. Because they will insist that they will be going forth against Israel, but Gog will defend the Antichrist peace covenant. Gog, the king of the north, will then betray the same seven-year peace covenant that he had defensed previously. Um, that's And then in Daniel 11, 44, it says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Because he just got done defending the peace covenant. And now he's got to go against it. That's going to trouble him. All right, now, we have two conclusions to choose from for the second clause of 39.2. Either Gog of Russia will leave one-sixth of his military in northeast Africa, or he, or if he returns back to Russia with his forces coming back from northeast Africa, he will leave one sixth of his forces in Russia and leave but the sixth part of you. I believe that since this first clause declares the turning back from northeast Africa, the Gog of Russia will leave one sixth of his military forces behind to maintain stability the stability of Northeast Africa as if policing it for Antichrist. Okay? So he's leaving forces behind and then going forth since he had just defeated Egypt, Sudan, and Libya. Um, he would leave forces behind to police it. Now, because Gog of all, and all of his military bands, 38, 2 through 6, are to come up, are to be coming up the mountains, from the north parts of the land, then he, Gog, may take his military back to the north part of the land to all go in together, all bands, and enter into the mountains of Israel as one big storm. Okay. Now, verse 3 of 39. Uh, I will smite your bow out of your left hand and will cause your arrows to fall out of your right hand. Now, since conventional war weapons were not known as of uh, of 2600 years ago this needs to be interpreted within a spiritual reality the reality will be that whatever weapons used by gog of magog and all of his bands will all fail in their hands tank cannons flames and guns will fail rifles and pistols will fail bow and arrows will fail swords will will only work on one another grenades will fail rockets will fail they will all be sitting ducks for the pestilences, fire, and brimstone to fall upon them. That's in verse 22 of chapter 38. This reality in this verse will be the reason why not one Israeli will be harmed. That's verse 8 of chapter 38. And they shall dwell safely, all of them. Right? How is that that they would dwell safely? Well, this verse here explains it. None of their weapons will be effective to them. For Gog and all of his band. They will absolutely not work. They will fail. They will be sitting, sitting ducks. All right. Verse 4. 
You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your bands and the people that are with you. I will give you unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Okay, with the judgment having occurred, 38, 19 through 22, the Lord revealed that the corpses will be devoured at least until they are buried. Now, the difference between 39, 4 and Revelation 19, 17 is the lack of the adjective all. Um, at Armageddon, seven years later, all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven will be in the valley of Jehoshaphat to feast on the many dead corpses. While at this smorgasbord here, it will be ravenous birds of every sort, and then re these ravenous birds of every sort will not will not be all fowls in the earth. Uh, in Ezekiel 39, 4 and 17, there will be both fowls and beasts devouring flesh from this judgment. We can associate the event in Isaiah 18 through 19 with the beginning of the seven years of judgment, since we can be sure that the Ezekiel 38, 39 judgment will be at the beginning of the seven years as well. The, the um let me see if i explain that not not much but um isaiah 18 and 19 is the destruction of egypt at the hands of the king of the north basically if you tie it in um or gog of magog um the um ezekiel 32 um, or excuse, I should say chapter 29 and 30, and then again in 32, um, reveals this uh, annihilation of Egypt. Um, so, the messengers, ambassadors, will be coming to Northeast Africa to bring God's word to the scattered and peeled Africans after the terrible de devastation to the land. You can read about that in Isaiah 18, 1 and 2. The fowls and the beasts of Isaiah 18, 6 will be eating the flesh over northeast Africa, almost at the same time that the fowls and beasts will be eating the flesh of Gog and Gog of Magog and all of his bands in the mountains of Israel. Almost, I mean, right after another, he's, the, the, all the, 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 the flesh will be in the fields in, in northeast Africa, and then they'll be rushing back to the mountains of Israel, and then within a day or two or whatever it is, they'll be, they'll be destroyed, and then the, the, the fowls and the beasts will be, will be devouring them in the mountains also. So um, I guess either way, someone with Gog and Magog and his troops were going to die and be eaten by beasts of the earth and fowls of the earth. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. You can refer back to my commentary in verse 9 of chapter 30 of Ezekiel, where I reviewed this um, encounter uh, there. Now, I will give you unto the ravenous birds of every sort into the beasts of the field to be devoured. And that's here in 39, right? So it's two different events where birds and beasts are going to be devouring, and it's going to be not simultaneously within days of each other. Um, verse 5, you shall fall upon the open field because I have spoken it, says the Lord, the Lord God. The entirety of the military forces of Russia, Iran, Ukraine, Turkey, Georgia, Sudan, Libya, and Az Azerbaijan, and possibly but not likely even Kazakhstan, Bulgaria, Moldova, and Romania will fall upon the open field within the mountains of Israel. Because the Lord has declared this, it is sure to happen, says the Lord God. All right. Now, and if you want to know where I got all of these countries I just mentioned, it's in 38, 2 through 6. If you studied that thoroughly, you would come up with the same information. I did the video, if you want to check it, or it's in my book, um, how, I, how I have come to this conclusion. Verse 6. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. One of the more scariest verses in the Bible. This is a scary reality that shall come upon the land of Magog, Russia, during this time. Russia will have most likely sent a nuke on the Aswan Dam before the events, uh, the event of uh, Ezekiel 29, 9 through 12. Uh, that's where he sends it on the Nezwa Dam in Ezekiel 29, 9 through 12. Uh, Russia does. We do not, we, excuse me, do, we do know that Isaiah 17, 1 can most likely be a nuclear hit as well. This nuclear war is eminent. All right. I think I spelled that wrong. God plans on a nuclear exchange 
which will devastate Russia, Magog, with fire. Now, this isn't going towards a person. There's no person called Magog at this time. This is this, the land of Magog, the land of Russia, will be consumed, devastated with fire, as well as the islands of Asia and the Middle East. Zechariah chapter 5 describes a nuclear missile in detail to Zechariah, which the English translators and ill-equipped theologians and pastors have mistranslated. Please review my Bible commentary for the book of Zechariah in order to better understand the nuclear prophecy. Um, when the nu this nuclear war comes to pass, then the world will know that it was the Lord God who had declared it upon the world. They shall know that I am the Lord. So God has declared a nuclear war. So if Magog, if Russia is destroyed by a nuclear attack, might that be the United States doing it? The United States has the nukes that are pointing at Russia. So if the United States is pointing nukes at Russia and they get fired at Russia, would not the, the nuclear missiles in Russia get fired at the same time at United States? That's what's kind of scary because I live in the United States, but I don't plan on being here. I plan on going up with the church before the event. Um, Zechariah, I'll go over some of Zechariah because it's interesting how it correlates with this. Then said he unto me, this is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that steals shall be cut off as on this side, according to it, on one, and on one that swears shall be cut off as on that side, according to it. All right. So in Zechariah 5, 3, the conjunction then links to the previous statement. The cherub angel had revealed a declaration of a coming judgment which will be set upon the people of the earth god is one who blesses as well as curses the curse is designated against a certain people who have performed certain acts that god is going to place judgment against for everyone that steals and everyone that swears are the two sins the verb steals is translated from the hebrew verb ganab which is defined as to steal 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 away carry away the verb swears is translated from the hebrew verbs shabbat which is defined as to swear take an oath the words shall be cut off is translated from the hebrew verb naga uh, naga which has the has a definition of either to be made clean and pure or it has an adverse condition the uh, definition to mean to be desolate bare and extirpated ex, extirpated extirpated with the flexibility of the definition of the hebrew verb naga did i do that wrong i need to fix that one can refer to Ze zechariah 4 5 4 in order to figure which definition pertains to this, these people um verse 4 of zechariah 5 i will bring forth says the lord of hosts and it shall enter the house of the uh, of the thief and into the house of him that swears falsely by my name and it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof now this verse needs to be used while interpreting zechariah 5 3 if 5 3 one knows that god will judge those who steal and swear falsely the the details of the two sins are given more clarity here there are those who are we stealing as a thief i believe this can be also applied to those that steal from the truth commit adultery and even those that backstab their neighbors covet and covet and envy those that are swearing falsely by god's name can be understood to be those who say that they believe in god and swear by his name but turn and sin like the devil it can be all of those that all, all those that commit idolatry putting worldly worldly things above god even though even though they say they believe in him basically these two offenses can be applied to the entire ten commandments which these people have violated all right now in zechariah 5, zechariah 5 3 the hebrew verb naka can be applied with both definitions from the above paragraph and applied to the phrase shall be cut off at the, on this side and to it according to it uh, on, the, on that side, according to it, okay. This judgment will separate the good from the wicked. It will purge the righteous as clean and pure while purging the wicked to be desolate and bare. Those that are wicked will have used up their time to repent and judgment will then fall upon them. Zechariah is told that it shall remain in the midst of the house. This seems to imply that the people will be caught unawares while they are at home living life as normal when the judgment enters into their house. 
The rest of the verse indicates that this judgment will be something that will consume the natural things, such as timber and even stone, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. This judgment will have to be something of very intense heat level to consume stones. And Zechariah 5 also describes in, uh, specifically a nuclear warhead, if you uh, were, weren't not deceived by the translators and your theologians that choose not to research. Um, let's go on to verse 7. So we got nuclear war coming. And um, the church will not be here, by the way, in case you, you, you Christians are worried or concerned. Verse 7. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people, Israel, and I will let them pollute my holy name. I will not let them pollute my name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. This is very important right here. You shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. After the nuclear exchanges and the massive failed attack of Gog of Magog, Israel will remain unharmed and safe. If we look back to 38.8, the Lord guaranteed Gog of Russia that Israel, Israel will all dwell safely in spite of what is to be happening on their mountains. This nuclear war will not harm the people living within the land of Israel. Okay, so the Messiah is referred to throughout Isaiah's writings as, okay, let me go back. The Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah. The Messiah is referred to throughout Isaiah's writings. One name for Messiah, which seems to be the most frequently used by Isaiah, um, is the Holy One of Israel. This name occurs 25 times in the book of Isaiah, while only seven times within the rest of the Old Testament. The name reveals God's transcendence and closeness to his people. The Holy One is conveyed to be the creator. That's, um, I'm sorry, Isaiah 41.20, the maker, and Isaiah 17.7, 7, 17.45.11. Uh, Isaiah 54.5, the Redeemer in Isaiah 38.17, 48.17, 49.17, and 54.5, the Savior in Isaiah 43.3. Many times he's called the Lord and God. So here, because of the Gog, battle of Gog and Magog and the destruction in the mountains of Israel, that the heathen shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. They will not let pollute my holy name anymore. So this is an important verse. The Lord implied that he would not let the people of Israel pollute his holy name anymore. This seems to imply that after this nuclear war and protection from Gog of Magog attack, that the Lord will not tolerate them blaspheming Jesus, the Messiah, any longer. This is a pretty scary statement to consider since there are a majority of Israel that deny their Messiah currently, right? I'm going to put you on hold a minute and turn on some lights. All right. Okay. These people of Israel, the heathen, Maybe a part of that two thirds, Zechariah thirteen eight, who will be who will die during the seven years seventieth week of Daniel, nine twenty four through twenty seven. Also, we must consider that the one third who come through the seven years, Zechariah thirteen nine, may have come to the belief in their Messiah once these events in Ezekiel thirty eight thirty nine occur or happen. All right, that's what I take from this because um, he's not going to tolerate it anymore. And he's already implied in Zechariah 13, 8, that two-thirds of Israel that are in the world, I should say, but I would say in the land of Israel are going to die during the seven years. But he'll bring one-third of them through the fire, through the seven years. So that's the way I take this. Um, and there's Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, if you want to read it. Okay. You can pause it and read it. I'm not going to read it now since I just told you what it means. Uh, Ezekiel 39, 8. Behold, it has come and it is done, says the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. This implies that on that day when all of this occurs, the people of Israel should realize it because the Lord God had declared it. Then seeing it so accurately and supernaturally fulfilled that this will be astounding to all. Okay, verse 9. 
And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the hand staves and the spears. They shall burn them with fire. Okay, for se fire seven years. I, I, I put it in red, but because it's very important to understand. The aftermath of the nuclear war and the death of the militaries in the mountains of Israel will bring peace to the world for the remainder of the first half um, of the seven years. Midst. All right. And you'll find the midst mentioned in these verses in Old and New Testament. For the remainder of the seven years, 70th week of Daniel 9, 9 24 to 27, in Israel's inhabitants will be burning the weapons left over in their land. All right. This buildup of war, of war, then the actual war occurring, may only take a, a few days or weeks of the first days of the seven years. The weapon burning with fire will take what is left of that seven years. As was disclosed in 3811, it will take the seven-year peace covenant to put Israel at ease in order to have them be a land of unwalled villages with no walls nor gates. So the battle of Gog of Magog has to occur into the seven years in order for Israel to be as 3811 has stated. Because up until Ezekiel 38, there's, I mean, I shouldn't say that. Up until the seven year peace treaty, Israel is going to be, well, there's going to be the Psalm 83 battle that's going to be a result of the, uh, the nuking of Damascus and then the nuking of Egypt as a result of the peace treaty. So there's going to be a peace treaty that's going to have to happen after the Psalm 83 battle. The church was going to be, is going to be removed during that Psalm 83 battle at some, at some point. Seven year peace treaty, the Antichrist will then be known. And then Ezekiel 38 and 39, King of the North, Daniel 11, 40 through 45 are together. So the seven years of weapon burning, they're not going to, uh, Jesus is coming back on the last day of the seven years. So they're not going to be burning weapons, whatever time there that they took up from the beginning of the seven years into the millennial kingdom. So you have to say that the remaining time left in the seven years after the Battle of Gog and Magog, they're going to be burning weapons because um, it may be um, two weeks shy of seven years. Whatever it is, um, it has to comply this way because that's the way God has put it here. They're going to be burning weapons, and they're not certainly going to be burning weapons during the Millennial Kingdom. They're not. They just, you can argue that all you want, but Jesus is not going to have them burning weapons. The, well, he can come back and he can burn them and, and, and evaporate them and if the snap of his fingers. So why would he have them burning them? He, he's going to have them doing, preparing the temple, preparing the kingdom. They're going to be focused on that, not burning of the weapons. So anyway, back to Ezekiel 39, verse 10. So that they shall, sh shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them and rob those that robbed them, says the Lord God. Now, we know that there will be seven years of weapon burning with fire, as of the last previous verse. But no wood out of the field nor trees out of the forest will be used for that fire. So the people of Israel will have to find a fueled furnace of some sort. God doesn't give us those plans. <laughs> so some sort of fueled furnace is going to be used in order to burn all of those, those weapons with fire over the seven years. Now it's going to have to be a, a hot furnace because a lot of these weapons are going to be made of steel. The remains of the dead men in the mountains of Israel will be robbed for the spoils of war. As people gather these dead bodies and bury them, that's verse 12 of 39, the spoils remaining of their bodies will be robbed by the people of Israel. These many nations of people, Russia, Iran, Ukraine, Turkey, Georgia, Sudan, Libya, Azerbaijan, and possibly Kazakhstan, have been guilty of spoiling and robbing Israel for millenniums. And these people of Israel will gather the spoils of this war to their own benefit. Okay, understandable. God's giving it to them says it here. Verse 11, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto, the, unto Gog a place 
there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passage of the passengers, and there they shall bury Gog and all of his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamongog. So hard to or think of or or interpret this without doing a little bit of digging. All right, no pun intended. Um, the name Hamongog means multitude of Gog. The Lord has promised a burial place, graves for Gog and all of his bands. The, all of the bands in uh, chapter 38, 2 through 6. All the, all of the people, the, those that came into the mountains of Israel to destroy Israel. Okay, it's in a valley on the east side of the Dead Sea. All right. Yes, in the original promised inheritance of Israel, God provided Reuben. The eldest son of Jacob, Joshua 13, 7, this portion of land. Therefore, this land is Israel's land as was promised. And that map on page 468, um, where I showed the um, the map, the, the inherited map, the inheritance. All right. So it, it's a known place already. Um, you, If you were to keyword Hamangog on Google, you would see a specific place named the Valley of Hamangog. It's like they've already addressed uh, where they're going to be burying Gog and Magog. And they've already assigned it. Um, and it's there. You can't see it in the Bible anywhere, the exact location, but Israel's already planned it. The translators have used the English plural noun passengers for the plural Hebrew verb participle form of a bar which is defined as passers through or passers by. The world media may want this to be a tourist attraction, but it will be so horribly dreadful that no one will want to even be, drive a vehicle close enough to smell this unless they are there for a purpose. I would not say the plural noun passenger, yeah, I would not say the plural noun passengers is completely wrong, but a little inaccurate. Passengers are those that ride within something, car, bus, truck, helicopter, plane, while passers-by would include those on foot and even riding horses. I will elect to use passers-by as my assertion to this verse. Now, um, I'll, I'll continue because you're going to see what it will, um, how it's going to fall in place. Comically, the Lord used a bit of humor when stating that the decaying bodies of these dead men will stop the noses of these passers-by. The Hebrew verb participle hesam means muzzle the noses. Either way, it's kind of comical the way the Lord put it. He's, he didn't say it's going to stink. He just said they're going to be muzzling their noses. <laughs> it's obvious why. It will be that those that will travel to the valley of dead, of the, the, this valley of dead, decaying bodies, that will be on the ver that very mission, which means they will probably be prepared to muzzle their noses. They will bury these smelly dead bodies, Gog and all of his multitudes, in the valley east of the Dead Sea, which is the current country of Jordan. This valley has already taken the name as the Valley of Hamagog in anticipation of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Many want to place this valley north of the Arnon River, which may happen as a self-fulfilled prophecy because of this. All right. So if you look at the uh, map of the Dead Sea, you'll see the Arnon River, and that's basically where they've pinpointed this valley of Hemingog is. All right, and I'm not going to take you back to the maps. You can do the, the yourself. I've got a lot of maps in Ezekiel 38. All right, so um, 39, 12, and seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing of them that they may cleanse the land. Israel will assign workers to transport the thousands of dead bodies from the mountains of Israel nearest to Bashan. Right, where do I get Bashan? It's in verse 18, which we're coming to. Down the east side of the Jordan to the valley east of the Dead Sea. The bodies will lay piled up and decaying. They will stink badly, as the, as the previous verse has stated. Not only will they reek of decaying flesh, but the infested, but infested with rats, flies, and maggots. These workers will muzzle their noses or be wearing hazmat suits to protect them from disease. 
This will take the house of Israel seven months to perform this burial of the multitudes of the dead men's carcasses. Seven months, right? Okay, so. Yea, this is verse 13. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, says the Lord God. Israel will perform this burdensome task and shifts and duties. Right? Some will haul the bodies there. Some will unload the bodies from the vehicles while others bury the bodies. It will not be as much of a burden as expected because the house of Israel will be rejoicing in the Lord their God. He shall be glorified all around the earth. And Israel will be a pe in a peaceful state for the first time since 1948. AD. The Hebrew noun sin was translated as renown, which actually will be a memorial of the Ezekiel 38 through 9 prophecy fulfillment, which will be to God's glory. My own personal prediction of these events um, will be the dismissal of or the Islamic occult religion because their God Allah will be defeated. Because a majority of jihadists' movement will be destroyed by the God of Israel. Well, would, why would anyone continue to follow such a failure of a god? Right? Islam is gone as of this time. Because they will have lost the Psalm 83, 38, Ezekiel 38, 39. I mean, this is like almost all the Islamists are going to be dead. They might be a few sitting around. Woe is me. Who's our god? I mean... <laughs> I mean, they're going to be devastated. Verse 14. And they shall sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the, with the passengers, with the passengers, those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of the seven months shall they search. Now, the translators made a bit of a mess with this verse. Therefore, I will clean it up. Okay. Now, look at this. Because I'm not using passengers anymore. So they, the um, translators had already said passing through to bury, right? So shall sever out men continue to point for passing through the land to bury the passengers to remain in the face of the earth. All right, now, and they shall sever out. This is how I've I've put in passengers through the land. Um, they shall sever out men of continual employment, passers through the land with the passers by. Why do I say that? Because they have made a mess of this by adding their own um, prepositions and what have you. Or here. See this to bury? It doesn't have to be right here. That's where the English translators put to bury. So continual employment. Passers through the land with passers by. Through the land with passers by. Remember, passengers also means passers by. To bury. Right? To bury those that remain upon the face of the earth. To cleanse it after the end of seven months, they shall be searching. Okay. So the two categories. Passers through the land with the passers by the land to bury those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it after the end of seven months. Now, they chose to put, I mean, by the way, the same word that this was translated as passengers was right here. Passers through. That's where they got passers through from the same word. That's why they've already determined here passers through for the one. Uh, Translating translation of that word, and so uh, what is the word? Uh, da, 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 da. Where did I say? Where did I say it? I'm sorry. Da, 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 da. I don't know. I thought. Oh, maybe I explained it down here. Sorry. Um, the same Hebrew verb participle was used for both descriptions of passers through and passers by, which designates two separate divisions of workers. I am pretty confident to say that the one will be transporting dead bodies, while the others are to be burying the dead bodies. 
those that remain. The plural Hebrew verb participle form abar is defined as passers through or passers by. And that is used in both places here. It's used here, abar is used there, and here, both. So, since the translator has already assigned passers through to the first use of this plural Hebrew verb participle, I then use passers by for the second use. These passers by are the ones who will be muzzling their noses, as 3911 has, has declared. These people will be permanent full time employees of Israel who will be assigned the duties of either transporting dead bodies while others will be burying them. Sever out men of continual employment. All right. So, because they made a mess of this, definitely made a mess of this, to bury is better as to be put here because the way that the translators broke it down, uh, it's confusing. But it's not. If you use the correct English translation of the of the words, um, passers through the land with the passers by, and you, it, it, you've got two designations there, two of them. All right. At the end of the seven months, these same employees will be assigned the task of searching for others to transport, as well as bearing during the seven years. I would have to presume that this workforce will most likely be the ones assigned to the seven years of weapons burning as well. That's, that's a presumption. It's not like uh, confirmed. You can't confirm it. But it only makes sense, logical sense, if these are permanent employees that they're in charge of burning the weapons for the seven years as well. Just making an assumption based on what has been given. We can do that. Because God gave us a, a brain to make sense of things that he has said. And, and it's not twisting. It's, there's no twisting going on here. Presumptions. I made a presumption based on evidence. And the passers that pass, based on common sense, and the passers that pass through the land when any sees a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it to the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamagog. Now, here he says passengers again. Now, since we've designated that the the passers through, along with the translators, through, passers through, passers through, all right? So the, pa the passers through the land, when they notice a man's bone, their responsibility would be to set up a marker by it. When the passers by barriers, Remember, I, I, I was going to make sense of this for you. The barriers are the passers-by. See the marker. They will find the bone and bury it in the valley of Amagog. The marker will remain in place until the passers-by barriers have buried the bone in the valley. This might be taking place for the entire seven years. Right? So the two designations, passers-through and passers-by. because passers through have been given the responsibility by the translators up here as being the first ones and the passers by must be the barriers all right verse 16 and also the name of the city shall be hemina thus shall they cleanse the land now after the seven-month stench has, dis has dissipated, the location will become a historical site to, commem to commemorate the defeat of Gog and his multitudes. He it will become a city called Hemana. Hemana equals multitudes, if it's trans translated out of the, of the Hebrew, and possibly a tourist attraction during the seven years, as well as, as, well as potentially through the millennial kingdom of Christ. Um, this can only be presumed by being, by being called a city but is like a, okay this could only be presumed by calling a city calling calling a city calling it a city i should have put calling it a city but is likely it it could be that this commemorative site will be celebrate a celebrated place because it might symbolize the destruction of the religion of islam the lord god of abraham isaac and jacob will be glorified as the protector of israel while the islamic god allah will be proven to not be a god at all.
Okay, and that's just a presumption. It doesn't say that anywhere, that last sentence. But I'm making a presumption because it doesn't make sense. Why would anybody follow a God named Allah who has allowed this destruction of all of his people? Not very nice, very, not very good of a God to allow this annihilation of, we're talking hundreds of thousands of Islamic um, militants. All right, verse 17. And you, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl, and unto every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice unto the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. Okay. The disclosure to Gog of Russia in 39.4 was, I will give you unto the ravenous birds of every sort, until the beasts of the field to be devoured. Now, though Ezekiel will not be on earth when this event unfolds, the Lord is addressing this to him to prophecy of the calling of every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Now, um, at the time, the calling will have already happened because it's written in Ezekiel. They'll just automatically come because Ezekiel wrote it. Ezekiel was the prophecy to them. Well, he prophecies to them. And the, the fowls then know they have a responsibility. Um, that's a presumption once again. But how is it that he, Ezekiel's prophesying 2,600 years ago for these birds and beasts to come? It, it's, it's not the God saying, and I will call. It, it's Ezekiel prophesying them to come. So it's the fact that it's written motivates these fowls and they, oh yeah they, they can't read it well everything's possible with god but god will make it happen i would have to presume that the adjective every uh would pertain to every feathered fowl and beast in the general area and not the entire earth the, the this prophecy is to god's glory because when these thousands of fowl and beasts of the field assemble themselves god will be glorified for having declared it here in thirty nine seventeen. When they do come to the feast, the fowls will summer upon them, while the beasts will winter upon God's blood sacrifice of the of this hostile multitude of men. Fowls, you know, fowls eat enough for a day's consumption, while beasts will eat enough to hibernate for a time. Most commonly during cold and winter months, Isaiah 18.6 refers to an animal eating huge amounts to cause it to hibernate for a time of digestion. And this is the Northeast Africa digestion <laughs> um while the but it's still fowls and beasts of the earth summering and wintering right um while the birds eat day to day like a summer day like in summer days we can associate the events in isaiah 18 and 19 with the beginning of the seven years of judgment in northeast africa because we can be sure that ezekiel 38 39 judgment will be at the beginning of the seven years as well because he's going to be called back from the attack on Egypt, from the destruction of Egypt, Northeast Africa, to go into North, the amounts of Israel. So therefore, it would already have happened, right? And so, because it's already happened, it's at the beginning also, right? That's where my um, conclusion comes to. The, mes the messengers, ambassadors, will be coming to Northeast Africa to bring God's word to these scattered and peeled Africans. That's Isaiah 18, 1 and 2. After the terrible devastation to the land, uh, Ezekiel 29, 9 through 12 states about the, the nuke, the fall, and the Aswan Dam. During this time, the fowls and beasts of Isaiah 18, 6 will be eating the flesh of the fallen dead in Northeast Africa, which will be during the same time as the fowls and beasts will be devouring the fallen in the mountains of Israel. Probably maybe difference by a couple of days, but they're going to be eaten for weeks. <laughs> okay. Verse 18, you shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, and all of them falling, or excuse me, all of them fatlings of Bashan. There's the Bashan issue. All right. The flesh. All them fatlings of Bashan. So the dead bodies are going to be laying in Bashan. Fatlings. 
As Ezekiel's prophecy began in 39.17, he continued here in 39.18. The prophecy spoken by him over 2,600 years ago remains active in order for God's sovereign power to be seen when the fowls and beasts come into the northern mountains of Israel to feast upon the many thousands of dead men. You shall eat the flesh, flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, is what God said here. Oleg Sadyakov is the current commander of the Russian ground forces. This concept of princes being eaten holds true of all or for all the ground forces coming into the mountains of Israel. They will be military commanders, which Ezekiel is calling princes. The Lord God used imagery here concerning his blood sacrifice of these evil armies attacking Israel. He used the same type of imagery for his future blood sacrifice in Basra when he will create the lake of fire on the last day of the seven years. You can find that in Isaiah 34, 6, uh, Ezekiel 35, 6, Revelation 14, 19 through 20. God will, be, God will feed his fowls and beasts only here in the beginning of the seven years of Bashan, east of the Sea of Galilee. Because of the last day of the seven years in Armageddon Valley, all fowls will, will feast, no beasts. So God will feed all his fowls and beasts only here in the beginning of the seven years in Bashan, east of the Sea of Galilee, because of the last seven, the last day of the seven years, Armageddon will, will be the Valley of Jehoshaphat. All fowls of the entire earth will be there. And I'll read you, um, now we're talking about the blood sacrifice in Basra. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood and it is made with fat, with fatness, and with the blood of the lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has sacrificed in Basra in a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Now, notice it says fatlings up here of his sacrifice that he declared up here. Sacrifice, even a great sacrifice in the mountains of Israel. Okay, so there's a link. Different events, one's at the beginning of the seven years, and other one's at the end of the seven years. Please do not combine Isaiah 34, 6 with Ezekiel 39, 18 prophecy. They are only related because they both are blood sacrifices at God's altar, which is the earth. This blood sacrifice of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan, will occur at the first week's of the seven years. Meanwhile, the Isaiah 34, 6 blood sacrifice will occur on the final day of the seven years. See my commentary on uh, Ezekiel 35, 6. The commonality will be that God will destroy the heathen who will come to destroy Israel in, the, in this Gog of Magog blood sacrifice, as well as Basra blood sacrifice to create the lake of fire tw on day 2520, the last day of the seven years. And um, Revelation, now, um, here's the last day of the seven years, but it's a different feast. You know, the, the um, Isaiah 34, 6, blood sacrifice happens in Basra, okay, which is in Jordan right now. Uh, and this is a different feast. Um, in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, cried out with a loud voice, and all the fowls that fly in the midst, all the fowls fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together into supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, free of bond, small and great. Now, this is Armageddon. It's not, it's not, Isaiah 34, 6, the lake of fire. Lake of fire is going to happen in Basra, right? Whereas this is in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Kidron Valley. All right, now, this, the Armageddon, Armageddon feast will occur on day 2520, the last day of the seven years, and only include all fowls with no beasts of the field. They will feast on kings also, while the Ezekiel 38 through 9 feast will only devour one king. Gog of Russia. The Basra blood sacrifice will occur separately from, Ar uh, from Armageddon and, uh, on separately from Armageddon on the same day moments before. All right. So Basra, the blood sacrifice in Basra, will happen 
almost simultaneously as, as Armageddon. Meanwhile, the Gog of Magog blood sacrifice will happen within the first few weeks of the seven years. Hopefully I've made that clear. The, the Lord will also has also provided Ezekiel the location of this blood sacrifice in the mountains of Israel. I had in the past thought that this was the mountains of Israel surrounding Jerusalem. I, ha I came to realize that Ezekiel was given this micro view of this attack here in chapter 39, thus provided us the exact location within 3918. The location of Bashan is the east is east of the Sea of Galilee in the northern mountains of Israel, Israel's inheritance. Interestingly, interestingly, God had planned for them to accumulate in the northern parts outside of Israel, and you shall come from your place out of the north parts, right? Daniel 11:45 has indicated that the king of the north, king of Russia, is to build his tents of his fortress between the seas of the glorious holy mountains of Israel. Looking to the map of the Holy Land, page 517, we can find that the two seas between the glorious Holy Land and the mountains of Israel are the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Most militaries will build a command center before carrying out the military uh, advancements, right? I think everybody will agree on that. When this Daniel prophecy comes to pass, could we see the king of Russia established in these tents before the attack? That's a rhetorical question pretty much because I've already proved it to you. The king of the North Russia may not proceed into North Africa, proceed into North Africa. Da, 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 da. Okay, so Gog may not have gone into North Africa, North, North, into Northeast Africa for that the destruction of Egypt. He may not have gone there, or he may not be going there. But we know from this verse that he is going to be in Bashan. This verse. But when the military turns back to the location of Bashan, he may establish himself in the holy mountains near Bashan. This would be on the east side of the Jordan River Valley in the modern-day Golan Heights east of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, here you go. I got some maps. Now, notice where Bashan is. Here, here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's the mountains of Israel. This is the valley. So, the valleys of Bashan, mountains of Israel. So, here is Gog of Magog, Vladimir Putin, if you want to say, with his tents, his tabernacles, I'm going to say right here near Bashan because he's he's established his tents between the two seas, this sea and this sea. Not between this sea and this sea or this sea and this sea. It's between this sea and this sea here in the northern mountains of Israel. Okay. So the king of Russia, Gog of Magog, may find his end in the command center established in the Golan Heights map below, when the Lord God will rain his great hailstones of fire and brimstone down down upon him. Now, here is a modern map of, there's the Golan Heights right here. This is Bashan. Notice heights, these are mountains. Heights, Golan Heights, mountains between the two dead, between the two seas, Golan Heights, Bashan, so you can see Golan Heights seems to be the location where Putin or Gog of Magog may put his, his tabernacle. When I say tabernacle, uh, fortress, so his tents of his fortress. For planning stages, he's going to be set up somewhere. Well, he's going to be, he's going to be like right here. All right. Um... Verse 19, and you shall eat fat till you be full and drink blood till you be drunken and my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you of my sacrifice. Now, the prophecy spoken by Ezekiel began in 3917 and continues here. The pronoun you refers back to the fowls and beasts, which will be fe feasting upon the many dead soldiers and leaders within the mountains of Israel in Bashan. Fowls eat enough for a day's consumption, while beasts will eat enough to hibernate for a time, most commonly during the cold of winter months. 
Um, Isaiah 18.6 refers to the animals eating huge amounts to cause to hibernate for time of digestion, while the birds eat day to day like summer days. Both fowls and beasts will eat until they're full and drink the blood until they are drunken. Drunken means they, they are they've drank so much blood there they'll they've drank blood to an excess we drink alcohol we become drunken to an excess we drink it to an excess that's what it means by drunken all right we uh, they're drinking blood to an excess the lord continued to call this his blood sacrifice as he did in 39 17 verse 20 thus you shall, you shall be filled with, at my table with horses and with chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, says the Lord God. This continues the prophecy spoken from the, the mouth of Ezekiel 39, 17 through 20 as a future prophecy from the Lord. Once again, the pronoun you refers back to the fowls and beasts from, the, from 39, 17. The table of the Lord will be set by his judgment of great house, hailstones, fire and brimstone, um, while the men kill one another in a panic from the great earthquake 38 20 and 21 the menu the menu that day will consist of horses mighty men and men of war while the chariots vehicles will be will be cooking the flesh in the fire okay they're made of metal right iron and metal they're not going to be eating the metal they're going to be burning the flesh so they're going to be eating burnt flesh too, or cooked flesh. Verse 21, I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall be seen my judgment, and that I have ex executed in my hand that I have laid upon them. This is an additional information given in reference to 38.23. The, the heathen, non-believers, shall all see this event, both victims and spectators, when the Lord God had declared this judgment and executed, laid his hand, um, executed it upon his mountains of Israel. He will be made greater magnify and hallow himself by this amazing event the world will have their phones and computers watching youtube videos recording recordings of eyewitness accounts posted for all to see the lord god of israel will be talked about all over the earth among the heathen when they shall notice uh, a supernatural event unfold he had devoured or excuse me he had, devoured, <laughs> he had declared over 2600 years ago years earlier that he would he would do this and then be seen to have fulfilled it. The whole earth will know that he is the Lord God, the Almighty One, the one the, to be glorified, and he will be glorified this, that the Lord God declared that he was going to do this, and he did it. Verse 22, Therefore the house of Israel shall know that I am, the great I am, the Lord their God, the Holy One of Israel, from that day and forward. So they will know that Jesus is the Lord their God. As before behavior before abraham was i am right as we ask him as will the entire event unfold before the eyes of the world the entire house of israel will also see it unfold whether they are believers or not they will know that he is the lord god of their father israel the house of israel shall know that i am the lord their god from that day forward this implies a great conversion from non-believers to believers though they will still not believe that jesus is their messiah now, uh, I, I can stand to say that we have a reason for, for this, um, that this may be the day that the blinders fall. I, I explain this in the following verse. This provides a starting point for them because belief in God begins their path to coming into repentance and belief in Jesus as their Christ. Now, what do I mean? Well, verse 23, And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel uh, went into captivity for their inequity because they trespassed against me and therefore I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword. The final seven verses of chapter 39 are a review of why Israel was to be restored from their disbelief. As soon as I read this, I remembered what was written in Isaiah 65, 11 through 15. The non-believers of the world know what israel had rejected that that israel had rejected the messiah jesus and killed him in a.d 70 jerusalem and the temple were destroyed for the second time and the house of israel went into captivity again the lord god hid his face from them and he caused the world to persecute and kill them for over 1800 years and many fell by the sword were killed now i'm going to go into this 
Uh, I've already explained this uh, in the, within the in Ezekiel before. I I had first discovered this when I did my commentary in Isaiah when I got to Isaiah 65. So I'm taking this straight from the Isaiah 65 uh, of the book of my, of my commentary on Isaiah. Um, hopefully this doesn't get too monotonous, but it, you need to know that there's something going on here in this verse. Um, but you are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that pre prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Now, this verse here has been very badly translated. <laughs> um, after providing an explanation of why the wicked dwell with, with the elect in Isaiah uh, 65, 8, then provide... Um, then providing the blessing plan for them in Isaiah 65, 9 through 10, Isaiah returned back to addressing the non-believer Jews in verse 11. The remnant of Israel who forsake the Lord and do not believe in his salvation through the Messiah, his Messiah, are addressed once again. Because this is prophecy, Isaiah spoke in the present perfect progressive tense while describing what they were, will be doing. They will live their lives for wealth and good fortune, as if worshiping the God of fortune, Gad, the translators have used the noun expression that troop for the Hebrew proper noun Gad, a Babylonian deity, which really causes confusion to a reader. Translators use the noun expression that number in place of the Hebrew proper noun Menyi, uh, which, is, which is the name of the Babylonian deity God of fate. Now, uh, Isaiah presents rebellious Israel as those who prepare a table for the God of fortune, and furnish a drink offering to the God of fate. This idolatry needs to be understood to not be literal worship of these gods. The people of Israel, since their return from Babylon, have not followed other gods, but have rejected their Messiah when he uh, came upon them between 27 and 30 AD, and focused themselves on their fate and fortune ever since. Non-believing Israel have sought out wealth and good fortune while loosely following the laws of Moses in their attempt to be religious. Okay. Verse 12. Therefore I will number you to the sword, and you all bow, also bow down to the slaughter, because when I called you, you did not answer. When I spoke you, did not hear, but did evil before my eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Sounds like the Old Testament God, but the Old Testament God is the New Testament God. Jesus is the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. He is the Son of God the Father. Now, Isaiah 65, 12 begins with the word therefore. Therefore, it is there for a reason. This connects to the previous verse, which presents a reason for God's judgment. He stated then the judgment is in this verse, which he shall and has inflicted upon non-believing Israel since the rejection of the Messiah. The history of the children of Jacob Israel has been full of heavy persecution in the last two millenniums. Jesus prophesied of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, uh, that happened in AD 70. He prophesied it in AD 30. Mm -hmm. And the temple, 40 years before it had happened. Okay, and there's where he, he prophesied it right here. Now, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in AD 70, right? Because of their rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. In, in, in 119 AD, Roman Emperor Hadrian banned circumcision based on Judaism de facto illegal, making Judaism de facto illegal. Between 135 and 137, according to Cassius Dio, 580,000 Jews were killed when Hadrian ordered the expulsion of the Jews from Judea. In 325, the, the first ecumenical uh, council of Nicaea uh, declared it improper to follow the custom of the Jews in the celebration of the seven feasts of the Lord. That's why we don't celebrate them either. Um, because of Catholicism, we are ignorant to the feasts of the Lord. Yet, Jesus has fulfilled the first four of the seven feasts. I, I, it's just so ignorant of the church to do this. In, in this case, it was the Catholics. It's just absolute heresy, and they've caused a, a darkness upon Christianity ever since. Um, which include the Feast of Passover, the day of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Right? This was done because the Jews were blinded and stained with the crime of the crucifixion. Uh, 
In 529, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian the Great published Corpus Juris Civilis, which 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 new laws restricted citizenship citizenship to Christians. These regulations determined the status of Jews throughout the empire for hundreds of years. The Jewish civil rights were restricted in, in 1096. In the First Crusade, over 5,000 Jews were murdered in Eastern Europe. In 1146, 100,000 Jews were massacred by the uh, the Almohads in Fez and 120,000 in Marrakesh. In 1492, Ferdinand II and Isabella issued the general edict of expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Approximately 200,000 Jews were expelled, including uh, the ones that came to the United States with uh, Christopher Columbus. They were ships of Jews. Um, there were hundreds of anti-Semitism events in the 20th century, which is low-lighted by the German Holocaust. I had hand-picked a few of the events, but if a person searched the events of anti-Semitism over the last two millenniums, one would find thousands of historical accounts of persecution of the descendants of Israel. The Lord declared that he will number them to the sword and then will be bowed down to the slaughter. The Lord has had a hand in the, their persecution because they rejected him. The, the, one cannot say that God did not mean for the Jews to suffer the way they had over the last, uh, over the last two, two millenniums. As sure as the prophecies of Isaiah have and have and will come to pass, so has this verse become been coming to pass. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and you shall bow down to the slaughter. The Lord God came, the Lord Jesus came to Israel. He spoke and called Israel to him, and they did not hear him. Instead, they did evil before him, to him and before his eyes, and did all the things which he delighted not. Right? Exactly what, what, what he predicted they would do. All right. So, uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to slowly track through this because this is kind of making this into a long video. Um, it begins to talk about Christianity again, where Israel is going to be cursed while God, um, they're going to be cursed and ashamed while God exalts his Christians. Um, okay. You can read this all slowly as I come forth. And you should be leave your and and you shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, because the Lord God of you, right? Their name is a church, but my servants. But you should. My servants drink. Show me first. Do my servants rejoice and be the same. All right. Now we're going to go past this. We've been called Christians. All right, so please read that if you have time. I don't want to go over it. Um, it's in support of uh, Christianity in Isaiah 65, after he curses Israel. Ezekiel 39, 24, and it, this is not an excuse for, for uh, replacement theology, by the way. God has a plan for Israel, as you're seeing here in Ezekiel. Um, 3924, according to their wickedness and according to their transgressions, have I done unto them and hid my face from them. All right? The persecution of non-Christian Israel started after the cross, where the where the Messiah had been put to death by his own people. Their uncleanness can best be explained by their lack of faith in God and the Father and his Son. Therefore, their sins were not forgiven of them even when the temple was still standing. This was all while the rejected sacrifices had been attempted. After the blood sacrifice of Messiah of, on Nisan 14 of AD 30, the new covenant had begun and any other attempt at, at cleanness was rejected by God as a lack of faith. Their sin atonement was inadequate to say the least, but because they chose to reject the gift of grace be provided by the sin atonement on the cross by Messiah, their transgressions were never washed away. Um, therefore, as Isaiah 65, 12 states, they were numbered by the sword to the sword and were bowed down to the slaughter. God hid his face from them, helping them because they had rejected him again. Verse 25. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the capity of Jacob and I will and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous 
for the whole my holy name. The timeline of this prophecy follows the past two verses right here. 39, 23, and 24, when God destroyed Jerusalem and the temple for the second time, um, the first time was there, the house of Jacob, Israel, went again into captivity, then had mercy on, then he had mercy on Israel and brought them back to the land that he had promised, right? He explained to Israel that he had not bring them back to the land for their own sake, but for his holy name's sake. Right, the Lord had made promises to the patriarchs of Israel, including King David. Therefore, he had been he had to bring them back to keep his promises. It was his holy namesake that was in need to bring them back to their land. Since May fourteenth, nine forty eight, Israel has been given their land back, and the Lord's mercy had begun to get to to be given to them, while they have prospered in their own country, while with threats continuously to wipe them out from the face of the earth from surrounding nations. Now, verse 26. There, this passage, okay. After that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and done, and none made them afraid. This passage should be con contemplated for what it actually implies. Isra Israel's salvation will not be until they receive the Holy Spirit of grace and supplication, Zechariah 12, 10, and upon the second coming of the Messiah. But Ezekiel 28, 20, 29, 39, 26 implies something interesting. Ezekiel implies here that, is, that Israel will bear their shame and their trespasses against God of Israel. If Israel bears their shame and trespasses, then that would mean that they will be in a position to accept their Messiah, which is Jesus. In my undergraduate work, I researched the blinding of Israel and had determined that their blinding would be withdrawn upon the second coming of Christ. But here in 3926, this may be the removal of the blinders from the minds and hearts of Israel towards their Messiah. From what we have in the book of Revelation, there will be the two witnesses who will go forth on the first day of the seven year, 70th week of Daniel. Daniel. Um, the two witnesses will be sent down from heaven supernaturally in order to teach 144,000 people of Israel, 12,000 12, Israelites from 12 tribes, not, not the, the original tribes. Um, in order for those future 144,000 to receive the good news of salvation through Messiah Jesus, their blinders would need to be removed. I believe this prophecy here in Ezekiel 39, 26 is the removal of the blinders put upon Israel, which will happen once they see the Ezekiel 38, 39 faithfulness of their Lord God. This is within the timing of evangelism of the two witnesses of Revelation 11, 3 through 11. Remember, the two witnesses will be going to, for the first day to the first to the first day of the second half where they got get killed. They were going to prophecy for 12, 1260 days. Um, in sackcloth, um, well, they're going to be prophesying to who, or they're going to be prophesying to who, or preaching to who. They're going to be preaching to the 144,000. Um, but the 144,000 will have the blinders of Israel on, right? Well, when will those blinders be t removed? It says here in Ezekiel, it's going to be removed here, as of when they realize that the Lord God is who that who has declared it that prophecy that that He will bring them back. Uh, from disbelief. I believe this prophecy here in Ezekiel 38, 39, 26 is the removal of the blinders put upon Israel, which will happen once they see Ezekiel 38, 39, with faithfulness of their Lord God. This is within the timing of evangelism to witnesses, which will begin in the first day of the seven years. Below is my interpretation concerning the afflicted curse upon Israel after they officially killed their first martyr of the crucified Messiah. Okay. And if a lot of Christians already know about the stoning of Stephen, here is the stoning of Stephen. Um, well, first of all, the blinding of Israel. We're going to read about the blinding of Israel first. Um, this was written by the Apostle Paul, prophesied by King David. What then? This is Romans 11, verse 7 through 13. What then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeks for, but the elect have attained it, and the rest were blind? According as it is written, God 
has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they have shall not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, Let their table be a, made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their back away, that they could fall away from God. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? This is Paul speaking again. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles, for to the provoke them into jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more in their fullness? Because I speak you, to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Now, so we know there's a blinding that's happened to Israel, and we can see it through the millenniums, to millennials, to millenniums. You go into Israel, they're still blinded. Even if you show them clear, clear scripture proof, they're still blinded to the truth. According to the Apostle Paul, God had, has blinded the nation of Israel to gospel, to the gospel and has given salvation to the Gentiles. Obviously, not all Israel has been blinded because there have been many Messianic Jews that have come to know Jesus as the Messiah over the last 1993 years. But the majority of Israel have not believed that Jesus is their Messiah. I will first show you a curse that Israel had put on themselves as they spoke in unbelief. As Yeshua HaMashiach was standing in front of Israel that the morning of the Feast of Passover, Pilate presented Israel with a choice. They could free one person traditionally that day. Meanwhile, Pilate was hoping that they would choose Yeshua to be the one that they would choose to free. He gave them an almost obvious choice between a prophet and a murderer named Barabbas. As they chose Barabbas, the crowd made a comment that became a curse that they had put upon themselves. It seems that God the Father obliged them and gave it unto them. Let me, get, let me read you that. This is in Matthew 27, 23 through 35. And the governor said, that's Pilate, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out the more saying, let him be crucified. With, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but ra rather a tumult was made, he took water, washed its hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of the just person. See you to it. Verse 25. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and all of our children. How terrible. They cursed their children. God brought fulfillment to the curse through the blinding of Israel as they asked. Now, that, this is just the title to, the, to what I was doing in my uh, paper that I wrote in undergrad. Now, does the Bible indicate when the blinding had begun? No. The answer is that the Bible does not specifically state when the curse has started, but it gives indicators in the book of Acts of, judgment, of a judgment being carried out. In the book of Acts, the apostles presented the gospel to the Jews on the Feast of Pentecost, and 3,000 Jews were saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was no sign of blinding of the nation of Israel at that point, right? If you're converting that many at, at one, time, one time. An additional 5,000 believing or believed from the reading in the Acts 4.4, 4, there was clearly no blinding of Israel happening at that time. Acts 5.14, and believers were, were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both men and women. Acts 5.14, we can still see a strong indicator that Israel was still receiving the gospel and believing. I want to remind you that not one Gentile has been written of in the book of Acts as being a believer to this point. Reading through Acts 6, the outcome was the appointing of seven deacons to assist in the management of the people of the church. Stephen was one of the seven. As one reads Acts 7, we find Stephen was confronted. He then spoke the gospel, which convicted the people accusing him. The offended people of Israel took Stephen prisoner and stoned him for blasphemy. Before his stoning, Stephen finished praying to Jesus while he looked to heaven and saw Jesus standing, not sitting, standing at the right hand of God. Why would Jesus be standing? Isn't he there sitting at the right hand of God? As uh, David said in Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool, your footstool, right? So Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. 
Now, because the people had chosen to stone Stephen, after hearing the truth of the gospel, Stephen became the first martyr for Jesus. When Jesus was standing at the right hand of God, he was passing judgment on Israel for their wickedness, for their unbelief, but also fulfilling the curse by which they had put upon themselves and their children, which had brought Jesus the Messiah to die on the cross. After the stoning of Stephen, Acts 7.58 included an introduction in the same chapter of a man named Saul. Saul was much, not, was Saul, not much later, became known as the Apostle of the Gentiles. I'll read you 758. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down in the clothes of the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. All right, now, um, verse 8. Chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul of, of Acts, and Saul was consenting to death, and at the time there was great persecution against the Lord, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad and throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Acts 9 through 1 through 16 provides a change of focus from the Lord Jesus Christ when he called upon Saul to be his apostle to the Gentiles. The timing of this shortly was shortly after the stoning of Stephen. All right, and this, uh, let's see, what was that? Shelley Matthews, okay. All right, while Stephen, in the midst of the country between the two groups of Jews, the Hebrews and the Hellenists, this intergroup division of, uh, adumbrates the subsequent division between Jewish and Gentile believers that will come to the, to the fore in the Pauline mission. The first potential Gentile that became a believer was not until Acts 8, 26 through 39 after the stoning of Stephen. In Acts 10, 9 through 16, God announced to the apostle Peter that the Gentiles are also to be children of God. God had Peter go to preach the gospel to Cornelius and his family, of whom were all Gentiles. Because the blinding of Israel had started, the Lord God started 2,000 years of the time of the Gentiles while Israel fell into, into the Isaiah 65 11 for 15 curse, which I had just gone over with you, All right? The curse began. All right, so now I'm going to read, when they dwell safely in their land and none made them afraid. Now, this is to be the result of Ezekiel 38, 39 prophecy fulfillment. After that, they have been born, they have borne their shame and their trespasses whereby they were trespassed against me. Now, they bore their shame and trespasses during the years scattered after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. Being brought back to their land in the end time sets up the coming of Ezekiel 38, uh, 39 prophecy. Then the Lord will remove the blinders from the eyes of Israel and they will be ready to receive the gospel of Messiah. The, the two witnesses are going to be converting 144,000 at this time. Bring on the 144,000 to witness of Messiah Jesus to Israel. Verse 27, when I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sacrificed to them in the sight of many nations, the heightened belief by Israel will be because God had kept his promises and brought them back to their land while also gathering them out of the surrounded Muslim nations who had been hostile towards them. God will be honored and hallowed in his people. Israel, in the sight of many nations, when the Ezekiel 38 attack provides a confirmation to many nations that the Lord God is protecting Israel, those many nations will understand that God is just and keeps all of his promises. Verse 28. Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them into their own land and have left them, excuse me, left none of them anymore. The Lord God had indicated that Israel will know that he is the Lord God, Lord their God, because he had brought them back to their land after he had led them into captive, captive in 70 AD. He applied here that Israel will know that he is the Lord God, Lord God once he had led every one of them back to their land. Currently, 60% of the earth's house of Israel live in the United States of America, while 30% live in Israel and the other 10% are elsewhere. This prophecy implies that the other 70% will be coming back to their land because the Lord has stated that he will have left none of them anymore there. 
this is a tough prophecy to bring into to fruition, but when we consider that the fall of the United States of America is imminent, the 60% will either die or flee across the world back into the Israel's homeland while in distress. God may chase the rest of his people back and they will be, or they will be killed in the process. Remember, he said that I will, br I will bring two thirds of them through the fire. Uh, excuse me, I will just kill two thirds of them, bring one third of them through the fire. So one third of 100% is 33%. If 30% are in, are in Israel now, they only need another 3% to come back uh, for it to be a reality. Uh, although, you know, there's more mixes of population, like some will die and some won't. You don't know what he means by the one third. But that one third will be those protected on that last day. They will be sent uh, into the into the mountains for two, three and a half years to be protected. That'll be the one third for sure. All right, verse 29, this is the last verse of Ezekiel 39. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them because I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, says the Lord God. The Lord has committed in 39, 29 that he will no longer hide his face from Israel because he will have poured out his spirit upon the house of Israel. The house of Israel's shame will, will not be born bare until, until, the, until the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? Their shame. This prophecy within Zechariah 12.10 is the specific time that this shame and remorse will be felt by Israel, the one-third, until that time a majority of Israel will reject their Messiah through the curse of blinders, oh, oh, I'm sorry, though the curse of blinders will be gone. Just as most Gentiles of the current age do, right, right? Um, Gentiles of the current age don't have blinders, but some believe, and then eventually some might. Not, uh, all of them don't believe, and then eventually some might believe, I'm sorry. But when the rescued remnant of Israel will have God's Holy Spirit poured upon them, all of them will believe in Jesus the Messiah. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them. And you can read Zechariah 12.10 right here. I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Who, who got pierced? They shall look upon me. God got pierced? God the Messiah got pierced. Pierced in the lower right abdomen. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be bitterness for him as one is bitterness for his firstborn. Now the Lord had committed to those of Israel that his spirit of grace would pour out upon them. This spirit of grace and of supplication described here is the fulfillment of the reconciliation of the cursed people of Israel. The curse of is Isaiah 65 12 will be reconciled and then and when they shall look upon me whom they have pierced the curse that they sh that they had put upon their own heads as well as their children's heads will be recalled no more. Then answered all the people, he said, his blood be on us and all his children, right? Um, in Matthew 25, 26, the people of Israel answered all together as they condemned the just man, right? The people of Israel know of the story of Jesus when he was crucified for blasphemy because he declared himself as the Messiah and Son of God. They will recall the piercing recorded in the Gospel of John. But when the uh, Gospel of John 19.34, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Zechariah reveals the sadness and mourning which they will feel when they will see the Messiah come to their rescue. And that's the end of Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel 39, Ezekiel 39 is the reconciliation of Israel. I mean... It's an amazing thing. I hope this is helpful to you. Hopefully you've learned something. Thank you for joining me today. Until the next time, may God bless you.